In this video, we're going to be looking at a single yet somewhat intense topic, 3.5, photosynthesis. All living things require energy. That energy is necessary not only for sustaining life, but propagating it via reproduction as well. For practically every living thing on Earth, photosynthesis is the process by which energy is first made available to living things in an ecosystem. It begins with producers, also known as autotrophs, capturing the sun's energy and producing energy-rich compounds from which the plant can benefit. Of course, when a plant is eaten by an animal, those compounds are transferred to the animal. In this presentation, we're going to be exploring the reactions and steps of the two-stage process of photosynthesis. Our current understanding of the origins of photosynthesis, based on evidence that's been collected, is that photosynthesis originated as early as 3.4 billion years ago. Before the evolution of photosynthesis, virtually no gaseous oxygen existed in the Earth's atmosphere. Therefore, since oxygenic photosynthesis is the primary source of atmospheric oxygen, the so-called Great Oxygenation Event which resulted in the first accumulation of oxygen gas in the atmosphere, didn't begin until 2.4 to 2.5 billion years ago. Over the course of more than a billion years, atmospheric oxygen levels remained relatively low because Earth's oceans were absorbing most of the gas. But in the last billion years, as the ocean's capacity for dissolved oxygen maxed out, oxygen finally began to build up to much more significant levels in the atmosphere. This diagram shows the range of estimates, red being a high estimate and green being low, for the amount of oxygen in the atmosphere over that period of time. Before proceeding, here's an interesting note about that spike in oxygen observed about 300 to 360 million years ago. This time in Earth's history was known as the Carboniferous and was characterized by extensive forests covering much of the Earth's surface. As those plants photosynthesized, they removed vast quantities of carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and released equally vast quantities of oxygen. As they died out and were subjected to geologic processes, such as intense heat and pressure underground, they gave rise to the fossil fuel that we know today as coal. Photosynthesis likely evolved in organisms not unlike modern-day cyanobacteria. Cyanobacteria are prokaryotic organisms that carry out oxygenic photosynthesis in much the same way as plants and algae do. Prokaryotic organisms like them were likely involved in serial endosymbiosis that gave rise to the ancestors of all plants and algae. As a result of nuclear fusion, the sun produces a variety and range of electromagnetic radiation. For example, we can perceive infrared radiation as the sun's warmth. Destructive ultraviolet radiation, thankfully, is mostly blocked by the Earth's ozone layer. But visible light is the range of electromagnetic radiation that we can perceive with our eyes. Based on the wavelength, we perceive different colors of this visible light. Blues, purples, and violets exist in the shorter wavelength, higher energy region, while reds and oranges are found in the longer wavelength, lower energy portion. Collectively, all wavelengths of light combine to produce white light. It is this visible light that plants rely upon for photosynthesis. Of the visible light that reaches the Earth's surface, only a tiny fraction of it is used in photosynthesis. And here's why. First, because the primary pigment found in plants is green, Green wavelengths of light are reflected by the plants and its other wavelengths of light in the blue, purple, and red region that are absorbed, which drive photosynthesis. Second, even some of those useful wavelengths of light are reflected by the plant or simply pass right through the leaves, 
missing the photosystems in the thylakoids that trigger the reactions of photosynthesis. And finally, biochemical processes are not 100% efficient, and photosynthesis is no exception. So what's the result? 20 to 25 percent of 10 to 11 percent of 40 to 50 percent is about 1 percent. Only about 1 percent of the sun's visible light that reaches the Earth's surface ends up being used to drive photosynthesis. Let's take a more detailed look at pigments, specifically plant pigments. A pigment is a molecule that, by selectively reflecting some wavelengths of light and absorbing others, appears as a certain color. An object pigmented blue will absorb wavelengths of light from red to green and a bit of the violet, but the blue light is reflected, making the object appear blue. An object that is red is absorbing all wavelengths of light from violet to blue to green to yellow and even a bit of the orange, but the red is being reflected back to our eyes. Black objects are therefore absorbing all colors of light and reflecting none, while white objects are doing the opposite, reflecting all colors of light and absorbing none. In plants, a variety of pigments exist in differing concentrations. It is the result of all these pigments in their concentrations that give plants and their different parts their distinctive colors. While there are many more plant pigments than this chart demonstrates, the selective absorption and reflection of five different pigments are shown. For example, carotenoids with their distinctive shades of orange reflect the wavelengths of light in the 600 to 700 nanometer range, oranges and reds, but absorb between 400 and 500 nanometers shades of blue. Phycoerythrin appears red and absorbs green wavelengths of light. Phycocyanin appears blue, absorbing yellow and orange colors of light. Those three examples, along with many others like yellow xanthophils, blue anthocyanins, and yellow-red betalaeans, are collectively referred to as accessory pigments. The remaining two pigments, and the ones most often found in the greatest concentration in plants, resulting in their predominantly green color, are chlorophylls. The two main types of chlorophyll are chlorophyll A, a green-blue pigment, and chlorophyll B, which is lime green in color. These two pigments vary only slightly in the ring portion of their structure but both have long hydrophobic tails that act to anchor them into a phospholipid bilayer. Chlorophyll A specifically is the main pigment that is responsible for initiating the reactions of photosynthesis for nearly all photosynthetic organisms. It absorbs light primarily in the red and blue-violet wavelengths. Before we dive into the specifics of photosynthesis, let's take a look at an overview of it. The reactants of photosynthesis are carbon dioxide and water. Plants obtain the carbon dioxide they need from the atmosphere and water through their root system. Light energy from the sun is what drives the energy storing endergonic reactions. Here is the overall balanced equation for photosynthesis. This image illustrates how the atoms in the reactant molecules can be traced to their final destination. The carbon from carbon dioxide ends up entirely in the carbohydrate product, and carbon dioxide's oxygen end up in both the carbohydrate and water products. The hydrogens from water end up in the carbohydrate product as well as newly formed water molecules but the oxygen from water is used solely to form oxygen gas. Photosynthesis has two main stages, each with multiple steps, which will be presented shortly. The first stage is the light-dependent reactions. The second stage is the light-independent reactions, which is also commonly known as the Calvin cycle. 
This illustration indicates when and where each of the reactant molecules are used and the products are created. Water is the reactant of the light reactions, which unsurprisingly require light, occurs in the thylakoid membrane, and oxygen gas is a product. In the Calvin cycle, which takes place in the stroma of the chloroplast, carbon dioxide is the reactant and the carbohydrate is the product. The connection between the light reactions and the Calvin cycle is ATP, an energy carrying molecule, and NADPH, a cofactor that carries electrons. We will explore the significance of those two molecules when we look at the light reactions and Calvin cycle in more detail. Looking at a cross section of a leaf, we can observe a row of column-like cells that run along the top surface of the inside of the leaf. It is within these cells that chloroplast density is highest and is therefore where most photosynthesis takes place within a leaf. Those cells being placed where they are and structured the way they are is another superb example of how structure dictates function. The arrangement and position of the cells, along with huge numbers of chloroplasts, promote high levels of efficiency in using light energy. On the bottom surface of the leaf are numerous pores called stomata. These stomata open and close to regulate the exchange of gases carbon dioxide into the leaf, and oxygen out. Although we've observed the structure of, of the chloroplast in a previous unit, let's review it. The chloroplast is a double membrane organelle containing its own DNA and ribosomes, allowing it to manufacture its own proteins. The large internal space within the chloroplast is called the stroma, and it is the location of the Calvin cycle. Thylakoids are membrane-bound structures that are stacked on top of one another and possess photosystems, which are clusters of photosynthetic pigments that are embedded in the thylakoid membrane. Recall from earlier that pigments like chlorophyll have hydrophobic tails that anchor them into the thylakoid membrane. The thylakoid space is the area inside of the thylakoids and is interconnected with all of the other thylakoids in the chloroplast. It provides a location for a concentration gradient of hydrogen ions, also known as protons, to be established. And finally, a granum, grana is plural, is a stack of thylakoids. Finally, let's begin with the process of the light-dependent reactions. We begin with photosystem two. First, light strikes photosynthetic pigments embedded in the thylakoid membrane. The energy from light is transferred ultimately to a chlorophyll A at the reaction center of photosystem II. Electrons are removed from chlorophyll A as they are boosted to a higher energy level. The electrons are temporarily passed off to a protein called a primary electron acceptor. Water is split apart to replace chlorophyll A's lost electrons. In the process, protons and half of an oxygen molecule are liberated. Once a second water molecule is split, a complete diatomic oxygen molecule is formed. After photosystem II comes the electron transport chain, or ETC. The ETC links photosystem II and photosystem I together. It is a series of proteins embedded in the thylakoid membrane that passes electrons from one protein to the next, much like in a relay race. As electrons travel from protein to protein in the ETC, this allows, ultimately, for the production of ATP. This is accomplished because the proteins of the ETC utilize the energy from the transfer of electrons to actively transport protons from the stroma into the thylakoid space. Now that a concentration gradient of protons exists, through facilitated diffusion, the protons travel back into the stroma through an ATP-forming protein called ATP synthase. 
The final part of the light-dependent reactions involves photosystem 1. After the electrons have traveled through the ETC, they are deposited at photosystem 1's reaction center chlorophyll A. Again, excited by light, they are boosted to a higher energy level just as before. This time, however, the electrons are transferred to an electron carrier called NADP+. NADP plus is the oxidized form of the electron carrier, but once it obtains the two electrons and a proton, the reduced form of the carrier is formed, NADPH. Here is a summary of the light-dependent reactions. Water is a reactant and is consumed by the light-dependent reactions, and oxygen gas is a product, which ultimately is released into the atmosphere. The light-dependent reactions also formed NADPH, electron carriers, and ATP, high-energy molecules. The ATP and NADPH, however, are temporary since they're going to be used up in the forthcoming Calvin cycle. For this reason, we do not identify ATP and NADPH as net products of photosynthesis. Now, let's take a look at a short animation from our textbook that will take us through the steps of the light reactions of photosynthesis. Zooming into a chloroplast, we see these flattened membranous sacs called thylakoids. Here, light energy is converted to chemical energy in the first phase of photosynthesis, the light reactions. The two green structures you see here are photosystems, large complexes of proteins and chlorophyll that capture light energy. An electron transport chain connects the two photosystems. Notice the small mobile electron carriers that shuttle electrons from one large complex to another. Now let's take a closer look at the steps of the light reactions. The photosystem on the left absorbs light energy, exciting electrons that enter the electron transport chain. Electrons are replaced with electrons stripped from water, creating oxygen as a byproduct. The energized electrons flow down the electron transport chain, releasing energy that is used to pump hydrogen ions, the blue balls, into the thylakoid. In the photosystem on the right, light energy excites electrons, and this time the electrons are captured by an electron carrier molecule, NADPH. The high concentration of hydrogen ions inside the thylakoid powers ATP synthase, producing ATPs. The light reactions in the thylakoid have produced two energy products, ATP and NADPH, that will now power the production of sugar in the Calvin cycle. If you wish, now might be a good time to pause the video and review all that you have learned so far. The light independent reactions, or Calvin cycle, takes place in the stroma of the chloroplast. ATP from the light reactions provides the energy necessary to power the Calvin cycle, and NADPH delivers the electrons that originally came from water that are necessary for the formation of new covalent bonds to build organic molecules. The Calvin cycle is a three-stage process that includes carbon fixation, reduction, and regeneration of the CO2 acceptor. Let's take a look at each of those stages individually. Before we begin, it is important to note that for simplicity's sake, only the carbon atoms and the phosphates are being shown in the diagrams. The oxygen and hydrogen atoms present are omitted to simplify and declutter the diagram. Carbon fixation involves carbon dioxide that has entered the leaf from the atmosphere through the leaf stomata. An enzyme called Rubisco will join carbon dioxide to the carbon dioxide acceptor, ribulose biphosphate, or more simply, RUBP. RUBP is a five carbon molecule containing two phosphates. Once the sixth carbon is added from carbon dioxide, that unstable six carbon two phosphate molecule breaks down. 
The result is six molecules, each of which contains three carbons and a single phosphate. In the reduction stage, ATP is broken down so that each of those three carbon molecules can be phosphorylated again. Now, each of those three carbon molecules has two phosphates. Next, NADPH delivers electrons to the three carbon molecules, which are rearranged and lose a phosphate group. The result of this transformation is six molecules of glyceraldehyde 3 phosphate, or G3P. One of the G3P molecules exits the Calvin cycle, while the remaining five move on to complete it. Before taking a look at the final stage of the Calvin cycle, now would be a good time to note what's going to happen to the now oxidized NADP plus molecules as well as the ADPs and free phosphates. They will return to the light reactions to be reconstructed so they can be sent back to the Calvin cycle to allow the process to continue. The final stage of the Calvin cycle, and unarguably the most complex, is regeneration of the CO2 acceptor, RUBP. This stage utilizes more of the ATP from the light reactions to rearrange the five G3P molecules into three molecules of RUBP. And now the Calvin cycle may continue. Just like before, the ADP and free phosphates will return to the light reactions to be rebuilt. At this point, it is important to note that although the Calvin cycle does not require light, it does require products from the light reactions. Without light, there would be no ATP or NADPH formed, resulting in the Calvin cycle that would stop right after carbon fixation, since the reduction and regeneration stages wouldn't be possible. Now, let's take a look at a short animation from our textbook that will take us through the steps of the Calvin cycle. The Calvin cycle takes place outside the thylakoids in the stroma, the thick fluid of the chloroplast. At the beginning of the cycle, carbon dioxide molecules combine with molecules called RUBP. The resulting molecules go through a series of reactions powered by ATP and NADPH from the light reactions. Sugar molecules known as G3Ps are produced. Most of the G3Ps are rearranged back into RUBPs that will begin the Calvin cycle again. But the important product of photosynthesis is the remaining G3P sugar. Some G3Ps are used to build glucose, which can combine into starch or cellulose. Still other G3Ps form sucrose. And some of the sugar is broken down by cellular respiration using oxygen in the plant's own mitochondria, generating ATPs that can power other work of the plant. Excess oxygen diffuses out of the leaf through the pores, while more carbon dioxide enters. With three simple ingredients, carbon dioxide, water, and light, plants produce sugar and oxygen by photosynthesis powering plant metabolism, and ultimately providing your fuel as well. Just as before, now might be a good time to pause the video to review what you've learned so far. So what does the plant have to show for itself after all of the processes involving Photosystem 2, the electron transport chain, Photosystem 1, carbon fixation, reduction, and regeneration of RUBP, a single molecule of G3P. A second round of the light reactions and the Calvin cycle would yield a second G3P molecule, which could be joined to the first one to form monosaccharides like fructose and glucose. As the animation showed, G3P can also contribute to the formation of starch, a storage carbohydrate for plants. G3P is also involved in the metabolic pathways that yield pentose sugars, like the ribose and deoxyribose found in RNA and DNA respectively. But G3P is more than just a foundation molecule for carbohydrates. 
G3P also participates in metabolic pathways that produce glycerol and fatty acids necessary for the construction of lipids. More than that, G3P is also part of the metabolic pathways that form metabolites like oxaloacetate and pyruvate that can be used in the formation of amino acids. Additionally, some of those amino acids that were made possible by G3P are reactants in metabolic pathways that yield the nitrogenous bases found in DNA and RNA. Photosynthesis is about far more than plants producing sugars. Photosynthesis makes possible all of the building blocks that go into the formation of every macromolecule of life, carbohydrates, proteins, lipids, and nucleic acids. The process of photosynthesis, as we have observed, is called C3 photosynthesis. C3 photosynthesis occurs in 85% of all land plants, but there are other variations of photosynthesis. A plant's stomata are not only necessary for the exchange of gases, but are also important in allowing water to evaporate from the plant's leaves. Plants will regulate the size of stomata to slow down or speed up the evaporative process, which effectively regulates photosynthesis. However, on particularly hot and dry days, if a plant loses too much water from its stomata, then it runs the risk of dehydration. Depending upon the severity and duration of dehydration, that could be life-threatening. In order to avoid this, plants will close their stomata. But as a side effect of this closure, carbon dioxide is no longer able to enter the leaf, and the oxygen being produced by the light reactions is trapped inside the leaf in a porous area called the spongy mesophyll. With the stomata closed, the level of carbon dioxide falls as the gas is consumed by the first stage of the Calvin cycle, and oxygen level is on the rise. The enzyme Rubisco, which is supposed to fix carbon dioxide to RUBP, will instead fix oxygen to it. The fixation of oxygen to RUBP, called photorespiration, prevents the formation of G3P molecules since no carbon is being added. While a full understanding of photorespiration and the benefits that it does carry are not fully understood by the scientific community, one thing is true. Over long periods of time, photorespiration is unsustainable since the plant would be incapable of manufacturing enough G3P to survive. Some species of plants have evolved mechanisms to minimize photorespiration. The first group of plants are called C4 plants. A C4 plant functions by first fixing carbon dioxide to an organic acid rather than directly to RUBP. This initial carbon fixation takes place in a mesophyll cell. The organic acid, with carbon dioxide attached, is shipped off to a neighboring cell where the remainder of the Calvin cycle can take place. The movement of carbon dioxide from one cell to another effectively creates a concentration gradient, promoting the constant influx of carbon dioxide into the leaf and its cells. Because the carbon fixation and the remainder of the Calvin cycle are occurring in two different locations, different cells, we say that C4 plants have a spatially separated Calvin cycle. Crassulacean acid metabolism, or CAM plants, utilize a different method to accomplish the same goal. CAM plants have their stomata open at night, when the risk of dehydration is relatively much lower. During this time, carbon dioxide is fixed to an organic acid, at which point the Calvin cycle stops. Remember, in order to move on to the reduction stage, ATP and NADPH are necessary, and they can't be formed in the dark. When the sun rises in the morning, CAM plants begin to close their stomata, and the light reactions start up. ATP and NADPH production ramp up, allowing the remainder of the Calvin cycle to take place. 
because the fixation of carbon dioxide and the remainder of the Calvin cycle are occurring at two different times, we say that cam plants have a temporally separated Calvin cycle. C3 plants experience no form of separation in the Calvin cycle. An example of a C4 plant is maize or corn. An example of a cam plant is pineapple. And rice is a great example of a C3 plant. And that concludes our somewhat intense look into photosynthesis, perhaps one of the most consequential sets of biochemical reactions for life as we know it. Until next time, thank you for watching and take care.